Our next speaker is Michael Nelson. Uh, he's come from Oregon State University. He's also the co-founder and co-director of the Conservation Ethics Group. Um, and the title of his talk is At the Intersection of Wonder, Power, and Worry. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. It's uh, wonderful to trade the Drury West for this. <laughs> Drury East. So uh, when I think about uh, experiences or, or questions about gene editing, and I'm typically in the realm of conservation, uh, should we de-extinct the passenger pigeon or the ivory-billed woodpecker? Uh, should we genetically alter tree species or salmonids uh, so that they better endure the impacts of climate change? Uh, should we edit rhinos so that they don't grow horns and become targets for poachers? Those are the kinds of questions I'm interested in. And I'm a philosopher or an ethicist by training, so I think a lot about arguments. Uh, actually, I think it's probably fair to say that I worry about arguments, I just, or just really fair to say I worry a lot. I grew up in the Midwest, so worry is in my, my bones, and it's in my vocabulary. You know, oh, geez, you know, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a professor. Uh, so I have a position description that looks a lot like uh, everybody else's position description, um, but it has this one, uh, one addition to it, which I realize adds up to over 100%, but I'm not a mathematician. So I'm going to honor my, uh, my contractual obligation to worry publicly, uh, and I'm going to just share some of the worries that I have uh, about this, this amazing technological possibility. And I'm just going to share five different worries. I have more than this, um, but I'll just share five. I'll, I'll take it easy. So the first worry I have with any of these kinds of conversations is what I'll call the, the stunted conversation worry. Uh, this is the worry that we will pretend that we can decide whether or not we ought to employ something like gene editing, um, these technologies in conservation, without due reflection. Most commonly, this comes in the form of the assumption that just because we can do something, that we ought to do it. The assumption that can, in fact, implies ought. Now, it's obviously the case that if you suggest somebody ought to do something, they should be able to. So ought implies can, but it doesn't go the other way around. Um, and when I say it like that, I'm sure your response is, well, duh, that's so obvious. Uh, that, that just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do it. It may be obvious, but we do this all the time in conservation. I deal with people who do this constantly in conservation, jump from can to ought, or just are bad at thinking their way through what we can do or what the truth of the matter is to what we ought to do. So I hear all the time, I work a lot in the, in, in the wolf realm, and I hear all the time that we can hunt, we can trophy hunt wolves without negatively impacting their overall populations. Therefore, what's wrong with it? We should hunt wolves. That's a very common and actually very effective refrain from state wildlife agencies. And it's a total violation of ethical common sense, which doesn't stop them at all. So my worry is that we're just, we're gonna do this again. We're gonna, we're gonna fail to draw upon the full power and force of the human imagination contained in our various disciplines and in the world's cultures and worldviews as we think our way through this. But my worry is a little bit alleviated so far because we've already accomplished a little bit of this here. We haven't just pretended that if we collect the right scientists together that we'll figure out what we ought to do. So we, we know this, we've accomplished a little bit of this. Uh, maybe it might be too early, maybe A minus at this point, but we, could, we can improve. So I want to I, I dwell on this a little bit, just, just as a way to get us, uh, one, one way to think about this. Um, if we want a, an argument that has a, as its conclusion anything that is prescriptive, right, any can or should, um, we have to, this is not just a matter of inclusion, um, this is actually a matter of logic. We have to, as a matter of logic, have two kinds of premises. Descriptive premises about the way the world is or the world, way the world might be but also normative ethical premises about what we value, um, how we think the world ought to be. So it's only by bringing these together uh, that we can arrive at, at this conclusion. So when I hear things like the FDA says, you have to do science and then you'll know what to do, it, logic doesn't work that way. Um, and that's not me, that's Aristotle. So if you have a problem with that, that's who you have a problem with. Another way to think about this is just this little fun infographic. I mean, if you want to answer that last question, um, you have to bring in the humanities. That's, that's the realm. 
So the second problem, or the second worry that I have, is what I'll call the horse poop picker upper worry. And um, I'll, I'll illustrate this with a story of my friend. Uh, this is my friend and colleague, Mary Beth Lee. She's a microbiologist from the University of Alaska. Um, she's also a musician and a dancer. Um, and her research involves microbes and plants and bioremediation, cleaning up oil spills, uh, cleaning up playgrounds at schools that are contaminated by, by diesel fuel. That's the kind of work that she does. And she's really worried about that work. She's worried that her work as a remediator uh, is good and important. And in fact, we should clean up our messes. That's what restorative justice tells us we should do. But it's also used as an excuse by those who would despoil those properties in the first place. It's an excuse to continue the despoilation. She's worried about being an enabler or an apologist for the forces in the world that are bringing ruin and harm in the first place. So we could call this the apologist's worry, perhaps, the worry that so much of what we do in the realm of conservation is equivalent of the person at the back of the parade scooping up the horse poop, propping up the continuation of the parade, uh, making the continuation of all this madness possible in the first place. So that second worry is, is very much related um, to the third one, the do we understand our real problem worry. Of course, conservation is absolutely a technological, um, a technological issue. Absolutely, we need new technologies desperately. And of course, it's an ecological issue. We need to do ecological science. It's a social science issue we're starting to realize, certainly. And it's an economic issue, of course. But most fundamentally, I would suggest, it's actually a moral issue. It's a conversation about how we ought to live in the world. So I worry, perhaps actually most of all, about the belief that somehow we're going to tinker or technologize our way out of our current mess, our real problems. It seems like our problems are actually more fundamental than that. Fundamentally, it's a bad relationship with the world. And it's hard to understand how new technologies alone are going to remedy a bad relationship with the world. It's actually easy to understand how they, in fact, could perpetuate it. So part of our conversation about editing nature, I would suggest, needs to also be about editing our relationship with nature. So the fourth worry, and I'll make this one brief, uh, is the, what I'll call the, the calculation worry. It's actually a, a set of worries. Um, and that, uh, that is, once again, we're going to be bad calculators of the costs and benefits of anything, but of, of course of these new technologies. So even if we assume that simply considering costs and benefits is the right way to contemplate the use of these new technologies, even if that's how we think we should make our decisions about this, which is a dubious assumption to begin with, and some have even argued that's a dangerous assumption. There's more to the world than considering costs and benefits. But even if we assume that's how we're going to do it, we need to recognize that we're not always very good calculators and that there's a reason that we're not very good calculators. Uh, in general, if, when the cost-benefit analyst is actually the beneficiary in any way whatsoever, even if that's prestige and, and promotion at our universities, there's a strong tendency to overestimate the benefits and underestimate the costs. Social psychologists have showed us this over and over again. So what does accurate assessment of costs and benefits actually require of us? How do we do this? When we do this well, what are we doing? What qualities are we manifesting when we do this well? Well, one might argue that the, the accurate assessment of cost requires empathy, uh, a lot of empathy. And the accurate assessment of benefit requires a great amount of humility, checking yourself for not, for not benefiting. Neither trait, empathy nor humility, is acquired without effort. And neither trait is at risk of overabundance at our institutions. So my final worry um, is, is, has come up a little bit in our conversations so far. Um, and this is what I'll call the who decides worry. And I think about the, the words of Aldo Leopold immediately when I think about this. And I think about this quotation from Leopold. He said, we end, I think, at what might be called the, the the standard paradox of the 20th century, our tools are better than we are and grow faster, better, or grow better faster than we do. They suffice to crack the atom to command the tides, but they do not suffice for the oldest task in human history, to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. 
So this was 70 years ago, Leopold warned us about this, to sort of check ourselves a, a little bit. Again, he's warning about the tools or the technologies not being all that is required of us, but he's worried too about our abilities to apply those tools. Decisions about gene editing or conservation triage or assisted migration or intervention in wild areas to secure continued land health in the face of climate change or all of the many very serious conservation challenges that we all face are enormously difficult. They are sad and they are serious. Tragic, no win quality. They have no win qualities to them. So that reality that we face, I think, suggests that we need certain kinds of deciders, certain kinds of people who make decisions in the face of that future, certain people with certain kinds of qualities. So I teach a class called Conservation Ethics, and at the end of each term, uh, I ask my students this question. I say, so, you know, we've discussed these challenges, we know the qualities of the future that we face, so given the enormity of the challenges, the sad seriousness of those decisions, who would you trust to make such decisions? And I don't mean people, I mean what are the qualities or the virtues in people that you would demand um, t for people to make those decisions. And obviously when you ask a question like that, even though I've had them for a whole term, uh, there's this awkwardness, um, this awkward pause, because they're not used to being asked questions like that. But slowly they start to give answers. I say, envision a person that you think you would trust. And what are the, why do you trust them? What are the qualities that they manifest? And so slowly, once the, the dam is breached, it starts to flood, um, slowly the the chalkboard starts to look like this. They start to mention all of, all of these virtues. I would expect a person to be all of these things. And this is not, well, it's empirical in the sense that I'm taking it from my students, but it's not quantified in any way. But the ones that are larger are the ones that they, uh, that they mention more. And the one that they mention most of all, but they cringe to use this word, so I make them use this word. Um, is they insist that the person who gets to make decisions about something's well-being has to love that thing. They'll fight like mad not to use that word, uh, which is funny in itself, actually. They squirm. So then I, um, then I ask them to think about people who are currently in positions that make these kinds of decisions, people that they know who work for agencies or at universities or, or wherever in politics. And I say, do you think those people manifest those qualities? And the students immediately shake their head and they laugh. Uh, and then I ask them to reflect upon their educations. And I say, um, you know, do you think your education is focused upon the manifestation of, of these qualities that you've identified as so important to the future? And again, they shake their heads, but they don't laugh very much uh, at that point. Some of them actually want their money back. <laughs> So our, our problems suggest that we, we desperately need thoughtful, wise, humble, respectful, deeply attentive, empathetic, caring deciders. Um, and as a professor, uh, it's not obvious to me that this is currently the focus of natural resource education at all, um, nor the, the focus of training in natural resource management policy. So how do we do that? How do we create a generation of, of wise deciders? How do we create deciders that can thoughtfully and wisely navigate the future that is before us? So while we sometimes offer um, as a kind of a conversation stop or comments like, well, who is it that gets to decide? I think that's a really important question. I don't think we should offer it as a conversation stopper. It's a starter. Um, I think we should take it as a live question and say, yeah, who, who does get to decide? and not think about individual people, but think about what makes an appropriate decider uh, in, in this future that we, that we face. What does it mean to be a good decider? How do we become them, or how do we, how do we craft them? I was trying to think of an alternative name um, for this and trying to think about people that I knew that manifest these qualities, and all I could think of is Dumbledore. And, and so you could call this, a, oh my god, Albus Dumbledore is not a real person uh, worry. So if we had a whole world of Dumbledores, uh, maybe. Uh, but I worry that we're not really focused on this. And I think it's, a, it's an imaginative challenge for us, but I think it's a really, it's really a worthy challenge. And I will stop there.